want to do a quick test first to see how many of you are actually asleep right now. Can you just stand up, all of you? So, yeah, and if you feel like jumping, it's also okay, because, uh, okay, are there any ones asleep? Apparently not, that's incredible. You are very welcome to stand up during the whole talk if you want. We can do it as a day of strong or something like that. So I, I do hope that I'm not going to bore you to death. So um, in the world of content management, uh, it's not really uncommon to be competing over features that no one will ever use eventually. And that's a crazy trend, of course, but it's a very mature market, and we see this all the time that uh, CMS producers are battling over features that will just never be put to use eventually on the websites that we run on the CMSs. So um, I'm going to talk about how we, as an open source project, um, how we see this and how we try to do something different than from the pack. Um, does this work now? Well, okay. I'm from Copenhagen. If you don't know where that is, you can see it up here. It was a really long flight. Um, this is a typical picture of Copenhagen. Lots of bikes. Uh, we go around on bikes all the time. And interestingly enough, um, Copenhagen is about the same size and has the same climate almost as Detroit. Um, but we use uh, 10 times less energy than Detroit. So it's a very green and very sustainable city of its size. This is also not an uncommon uh, view in Copenhagen to see this stuff. We've definitely taken uh, biking to the extreme. So one, one thing I want to tell you about, um, about me, um, because I've been listening to all the talks today, and when I hear Jason, this is what, what I think is happening. <laughs> I have no clue who Jason is. So I'm just a UXer, and I work with developers all the time, uh, but I don't understand anything about the technical foundation of the work that I do. Um, so, I'm the product strategist of the open source NEOS project. Um, the stable version is only in 1.2 right now. We are only a couple of years out of alpha. So it's a relatively new uh, open source project. So as a designer and a product strategist of an open source project, uh, you can't really do what UX is normally do, which is to uh, design very specific user scenarios. Because it's framework. Uh, and one of, the, one of the things that I need to do well is to make a lot of developers, hundreds and thousands of de developers happy to work with the system. And for doing that, um, we looked into different principles around the world and found that master planning and urban planning uh, was a really uh, nice area to match up with UX for, for software. And this is a famous architect called Oscar Niemeyer. And he said <coughs> that um, building cities poses a beautiful problem because you're essentially planning for something you don't really know how it will be used. So we took a lot of principles from, um, from master planning and turned that into the software foundation or the, the UX foundation for the product. And um, one of the key principles is that a city such as this here in Singapore has to be inclusive and has to be able to include anything and anyone. And that's about planning for a future you don't really know how it will look like. I'll give you an example. This is Copenhagen. And this is the harbor of Copenhagen in 1930. Everything done back then and planned in the harbor area uh, back then was based on military and trade concerns. So this is uh, the, the same harbor today. And there was just no way you could have seen how this would eventually be used back then when it was planned. And um, here's an example of the harbor being used for something completely different. This is me wind bathing uh, in pretty cold waters there. And um, coming back to the NEOS project, this is the relatively small core team that I work on. Uh, We're about 20, 25 people. And um, here's some of the technology we work with, I'm told. I don't really know what it is, but I know that it's PHP and something like that. <clears throat> so uh, there's probably tons of stuff in it that I just don't know what it is. 
So NIAS is a community-driven software project. It's free and open source. And then it, it comes from the Type of 3 community, which is relatively large and, and very old uh, open source community. Uh, if you don't already know Type of 3, anyone here uh, who knows Type of 3? Okay. Few? Yeah, great. Probably all of the Germans present. It's pretty big in the German speaking uh, countries. Um, it dates back to 2001, and the original version is way back from 1997. So we have two CMSs now, uh, the original CMS and the new project NIAS that I work on. And, and uh, the Type of 3 CMS is used to run, for example, the Lamborghini websites all around the world. And the NIAS uh, CMS is used for something like this, which is uh, the American Express uh, magazine for Centurion card holders. Does anyone here hold the Centurion card? American Express Centurion card? That is what the, the minister earlier talked about, that we need more filthy rich uh, open source geeks because you have to be really, really, really rich to, um, to, to hold that, uh, a Centurion card. You can actually find reviews of uh, a U-boat uh, for private use here on this website. But that's the CMS running this uh, that I'm the product strategist for. And the strategy that we have chosen is called uh, COP. <clears throat> I guess some of you have probably heard about this concept before. It's just uh, an acronym for Great Ones Publish Everywhere. And it's often accredited to the National Public Radio, which uh, use that as the guiding architecture for what they do. And uh, that has allowed uh, fans of the National Public Radio to do their uh, own applications that they then use to uh, funnel content through from the NPR API. And so that concept is of course not new at all. It's been around since the dawn of digital, basically. Uh, but the world is just still only beginning to really uh, come to terms with what that actually means. And we see lots and lots and lots of websites and organizations uh, running on what is essentially old print thinking and which makes it really, really difficult to apply a cope architecture. So this is also a slide that I don't understand anything about, uh, but I know this is the one that the NPR uses, the, the architecture for uh, the technical foundation for the cope APIs. What I do understand, however, is that we see cope more uh, apart from the technical foundation also as a cultural or cultural technology and it, we think it will have profound impact um, on what we as human beings can do with the information that's presented to us. So, first let me say just one thing. I really, really, really hate outdated information. <clears throat> so think about it. If I go to Foursquare, I, uh, I'm directed in the wrong direction, that has a pretty uh, direct impact. And uh, that is just because of obsolete information. And if you take uh, a new side effect of a medicine that's suddenly discovered, which is then not reflected on a local version of uh, the pharmaceutical website, then ha it, that has a very, very severe impact as well. Or if uh, I'm an entrepreneur in Africa, and I want to build a new business on some software where I research a lot, read through the features, and then suddenly discover that the feature descriptions are just out of date. That happens a lot and has a very severe impact. So, the content management world has basically turned to personalization. We've just, you know, looked at Google, uh, their personalization and personalized the search on Facebook, etc., and said, okay, we've got to build that in for all kinds of websites. That's got to be inside the content management systems. And at the moment, lots of CMSs are focusing heavily on that. And it's all about one thing, really. It's about bringing you relevant experiences, which is, of course, fine for a lot of different customers. Um, <clears throat> But there's, there's a but here, and a, and a thing that, has, that gives us all a lot of problems when we are talking about infrequent CMS users. Because this is the interface that's typically used, or this is the Sitecore interface, Sitecore is fine and everything, but this is the interface that an author needs to work with to do a personalization uh, of a website page. 
So what you need to understand here is that in this moment when the editor is using this interface, they have to mentally and emotionally connect with the target audience. That's extremely hard to do uh, for an infrequent uh, uh, editor or marketeer uh, using this kind of interface. So we have asked ourselves, will personalization um, <clears throat> bring us less or more obsolete content on the web? And we think in too many cases it will bring us more obsolete content. Why? Because it's very, very hard for the editors to actually understand the interfaces we're building for them, and it takes an awful lot of time to produce all the content that's needed to do a personalized version of a website. It's enough for many organizations just to produce one version of the content in one language, and then let alone speak of, uh, of other languages. So, and yes, we focus on the availability of up-to-date content. Sounds like a really simple thing to do, but, but it's not when you get down to it. And we want to build a tool um, that helps everyone know what is known, because that's really at the heart of content management if you think about it. Just take two, six, two seconds and, and think about that fact. It's actually why we think we still uh, have relevance as a product category. And in our dream scenario, we just want you to um, never ever be able to say, I didn't know anymore, because you can always look it up. We, wanna, we want you to make you say, I didn't find time to look it up. And that's a fundamental change. <clears throat> So the web has given us massive availability and accessibility of information, but because it's free for everyone to publish, it, also, it has also given us massive amounts of obsolete information. And a way to fix that is the idea of code. So how do we do that in reality? Uh, because this is not easy, when it, again, when it comes to the infrequent editors actually editing content on a website. So uh, we're working very intensely uh, on the UX side of, uh, of our product and are very inspired by uh, Red Victor, uh, former Apple employee, uh, who said that uh, creators need an immediate connection to what they create. And we try to make sure that our editor interfaces provide such a direct connection. So you see there's a very great dilemma going on here. And, and sometimes still is. Because we all used to working with CMSs in the way that uh, Karen McGrain describes as uh, CMSs looks like databases that threw up all over the screen. And it looks something like this, you know, standard forms. This is again extremely hard to use if you are still at the same time trying to connect emotionally, emotionally with your target audience. And then, some years ago, many of us CMS producers thought, okay, we've heard the cry for better UX in our software, let's all turn to in-place editing directly in the template. And lots and lots and lots of CMSs and site builders are doing that today. And the problem <coughs> is, of course, that if you ask your editors to edit in this way, then they're going to tailor the content to a specific design, which is the opposite of the Coke approach. This, this makes it very, very hard to reuse content throughout different output channels because it's, it, it's been thought about uh, in one particular design, which is, again, old print thinking. So in, in Neos, we turn to a concept we call the Edit Preview Framework. And this is a part of the Neos interface on the right hand or on the side there. Uh, you have statistics showing the editor how the content is kind of performing, and you edit in something that looks like a basic, very minimal word processor. And you can turn it into full screen editing, like in a super minimal uh, processor. And then over on the top right, over there, uh, it says Preview Central. And that, there you can build your own preview settings. So that means that. Um, the prioritized output channels for your content can be built into the CMS so that the editors can quickly go through a different series of simulations or previews of how their content will, will, will look like for the end user. It could be in a search uh, preview, or on social media, uh, on Facebook, or 
uh, mobile or on the desktop website again, but it all comes down to the core content. So we can do structured or unstructured content in this way um, and still have it be previewable in the prioritized output channels. So we believe very strongly in this, that this is the human-centric path. This is human-to-human -human interaction. We want to build a CMS where you uh, directly communicate with other human beings instead of doing a very data-centric CMS where you are essentially writing for the machine just as much as you're writing uh, for other human beings. Just think about CEO texts, for example, where content authors are constantly um, editing text just to, uh, to get higher search rankings. So to achieve all this, we need to design better interfaces. And this is just the first step. We have lots and lots of stuff planned for like a more full cope approach. Uh, but in general, we need to let go of this whole print thinking. And to a crowd like this, this is probably not that uh, wild for you to hear, but to many, many, many organizations and people, it's still very, very difficult to let go of, the, of this whole print thinking that content and form is glued together, which it shouldn't, obviously, anymore. So the organizations who are not yet digital at heart have problems doing this and we need to support editors to make that transition. So uh, we're growing in the extremely friendly teams. Uh, we would love for people to join us. We have a couple of uh, guys in India, we have a couple of guys in the US, most of us are in, in Europe, um, but we would definitely love to include more guys. And uh, if you want to check it out, demo, and uh, there's a download, of course. And you're also extremely welcome to just be get in touch with me. So I uh, hope everyone's still awake. I just want to say thanks for the opportunity to talk here. Thank you. Thank you.